the book of foundations, for as Psalm 11 verse 3 reminds us, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And on this Easter resurrection morning, we have before us in Genesis chapter 3, a pattern of salvation, an example of redemption, an illustration of forgiveness with all the major ingredients or elements included in it, which will either explicitly state or implicitly imply, occurring for the very first time in human history, the plan of salvation. And it's found in this incredible passage of scripture, which we all do well to hear and heed, which I'm calling God's pattern of salvation to the undeserving, subtitled, The Passion Picture in the Garden of Eden. So let me invite you to take your Bibles and join me in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. During this Passion Week, culminating today on Easter Resurrection Sunday, many people traditionally attend a church service, either on Good Wednesday, or Good Thursday, or Good Friday, or Good Saturday, or today on Easter. And in some cases, all of them. Many people have heard the scriptures read regarding the betrayal of Jesus Christ, the illegal trials of Jesus Christ, the scourging of Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the death of Jesus Christ, the entombment of Jesus Christ, and now today the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Perhaps they've observed the stations of the cross. I did as a child and a teenager in my Roman Catholic Church, and I was quite moved at seeing something of all the physical suffering that Christ endured. Perhaps many of you recall watching with great emotion the movie, The Passion of the Christ. I do. And when it was over, each person in that jam-packed movie theater walked out in absolute, complete silence, trying to process what they had just watched. And yet, in spite of all these religious services, in spite of all the events of this week, the vast majority of people who attend these church services, do they even really know or grasp why Jesus Christ had to die? What did the death of Jesus Christ accomplish? Why was it necessary for Jesus Christ to rise from the dead? And what difference does all of this make to you and me regarding our eternal destiny or our life in the meantime. In other words, so what? And these are the very questions we will answer today and many more as we examine Genesis chapter. But before we do, let me remind you afresh what true Christianity is really all about. True Christianity is first and foremost about Jesus Christ. Not about rules, rituals, and a religion, but having a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not a certain behavior, but about being born again into God's forever and forgiven family through faith in Jesus Christ. Not about your conditional performance and measuring up, but about being unconditionally loved and accepted by God because of Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Not about following a religious code, but trusting in a, the risen Christ just as you are. Not about law, but about love, the love of God toward you. Not about fitting some external mold and cleaning up your act, but about having your destiny forever changed, and then your inner life progressively transformed by God's power due to an eternal relationship with Jesus Christ all by God's grace. And if I can segue from that last point into our first principle I want to highlight today, God wants you to realize that He created you to have a personal, loving, and volitional relationship with you, and that you are ultimately accountable to Him. 
God wants you to realize that he created you to have a personal, loving, and volitional relationship with him. And that you are ultimately accountable to him. And that is why the Bible begins in Genesis 1-1 by saying, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You must understand that God is eternal and exists outside of the time, space, matter continuum that we live in. The word named God there is Elohim. It happens to be a plural name. As God is a triunity, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you see, in eternity past, they had this wonderful, loving relationship with one another. The Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Spirit, the Spirit loved the Father, and there was all this reciprocal love going on. There was this relationship that they had with one another, and they were in need of nothing. For indeed, God is God. But God wanted to share that love and relationship with others, namely angels and humans. And in order to do so, God provided a wonderful planet and a paradise for man, which we read about in Genesis chapter 1. And you see, we read also that the earth was without form and void of inhabitants. So what does God do? He begins to form the planet and fill the planet. On day one, earth, space, time, and light. On day two, he creates the atmosphere. On day three, he forms the land and he fills it with plants. On day four, he provides the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, the sea and the flying creatures. On day six, the land animals and man. And you see, God's crowning achievement was the creation of a man and then a woman whom God made co-regents over the earth. And thus in Genesis chapter 2, God now narrows that focus from that whole creation account to especially focus on the creation of mankind in providing us more details. First, regarding the creation of the man. As we're told, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And God then placed the man into a beautiful paradise called the Garden of Eden. And it was there, on day six, after naming many of the animals, that God realized, or excuse me, Adam realized his aloneness and his need of a companion to share life with and to fulfill God's mandate to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. And thus God created the first woman. He did it from the side of the man, and he brought her to the man, in which Adam exuded with delight and said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called wool man, for she was taken out of the man. And God then, in essence, performed the first wedding, as they became husband and wife. And the Bible tells us they were naked, but they were not ashamed. You must understand, dear friends, that God decided to create man differently from any of the other creatures in his image and likeness. God and man share a likeness that is not shared by other creatures. This apparently means that a relationship of close fellowship can exist between God and man that is unlike the relationship of God with the rest of his creation. And so in the beginning, the man and the woman were sinless and innocent and enjoyed a right relationship with God and with each other that was harmonious and holy. But since a love relationship must be freely chosen and not forced, God gave man a test, a test of their volition, a test of free will, a test for both the man and the woman. And it's recorded there in Genesis chapter 2, if you look with me, beginning in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so God gives man a test. Two trees, two choices, 
two results. Either life or death, which would they choose? Now sometime after God created the heaven and the earth, and formed it and filled it, something happened in heaven. The highest of angels, Lucifer, revolted against God and persuaded one-third of the angels to join his rebellion against God. And thus Luth Lucifer becomes Satan. The word Satan means adversary. He became the adversary of God. And who does Satan target then? The humans that God had created on earth. To sell them on the same arrogant ambition and devilish desire that he possessed, namely to be like God. And so we read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, as God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden, as he now plants doubt in order to dialogue. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the tree of the garden, fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. <coughs> Then the serpent said to the woman, becoming even more bolder, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God is holding out on you. God doesn't have your best interests in mind. He knows the day you eat, you'll be like God. He doesn't want any rivals, as it were, and therefore... He is prohibiting you from something that you would enjoy and would have great benefit to or from. What a lie. And yet the woman was deceived. So that we read in verse 6 these words. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And thus he disobeyed as well. She was deceived, he deliberately sinned, and as head of the human race, he is held ultimately culpable for original sin. So what happens next? Verse 7. Then the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. God among, the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So notice, they're in hiding now. Now they had fig leaves on, but they still felt shame and sense of guilt and they're hiding from God unlike anything pre previous to this. And so God confronts them in order for them to admit the truth. Verse 9, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Oh, that was true. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree, from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. As he shifts the blame to the woman. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And by the way, human nature is still that way, isn't it? So slow to admit we're wrong. So quick to blame others. And here, this very woman whom he had earlier said, with delight, she is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Now she throws, them up, she throws her under the bus. Because it's all about him now. And that is the problem of having a sin nature. Isn't it? It's all about us. Now God is holy. And God is sovereign. And God is creator. And therefore, he has every right to judge. And we see the judgment of God upon the serpent in verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. 
On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. An illustration, abject subjugation, humility and total defeat. But by virtue of the fact that it wasn't the serpent, but really Satan using the serpent to deceive Eve, we read in verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. A promise of ongoing conflict and ultimate defeat of Satan. Verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And now to the man, to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. And toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And now we know how the planet in paradise of earth has become a planet filled with sinners. Under the curse of sin and death and disease and degradation and disasters. Dear friends, Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3 explain and define our world. And should shape our world view as it sets forth the origins and beginnings of creation, of man, of women, of sin, of death, and the curse. And gives us a proper view Thus, God not only wants you to realize that he created you to have a personal, loving, and volitional relationship with him, and that you're ultimately accountable to him, but we also see in this chapter that God wants you to recognize your need of salvation due to sensing the guilt of your sin and its deserving punishment. God wants you to recognize your need of salvation due to sensing the guilt of your sin and it's deserving punishment. Not only did Adam and Eve sin, but so have you and me. And we were born sinners with a sin nature, and we have chosen to sin time and time again in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, and in our motives. And though you may not be as bad as another sinner, without Jesus Christ and a new birth, you are as bad off as the next guy. For you are spiritually dead, Separated from a right relationship with God and guilty of sin before a thrice holy God. And that's why Romans 3, 10 through 12 remind us, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They've together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. You see, from God's perspective, even the good things we do are tainted by sin apart from the new birth a new nature, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is why Paul goes on to say, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You see, God gave the law, including the Ten Commandments, not to get us to heaven, but to show us how holy He is, and how sinful we are, so we would see we are guilty before God. Verse 20, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. Why? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. How would you know what sin is if there wasn't some defined law to tell you? But notice, by the deeds of the law, you're not going to be justified. It would be like standing before a judge after you robbed a bank and said, but you know, I'm a really good guy. I'm a good parent, ask my kids. I'm a good husband. And what would the judge say? Guilty. Guilty of violating the law. And we know from Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have missed the mark. And that is why even as we think of the law, using it lawfully, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Do you ever put something before God? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Have you ever swore in Christ's name? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. Do you do that? Have you done that? Thou shalt not kill or murder. Jesus said, if you hate someone in your heart, it's like murdering them. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus said, if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. Thou shalt not steal. You ever steal anything? Thou shalt not bear false witness. You ever lie? And if you say, no, I've never lied, you're lying right now. <laughs> Thou shalt not covet. You ever want what somebody else has? Guilty, 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 guilty. You know, I learned at a young age that I was a sinner as I was caught shoplifting in second grade. And I remember later, even as a teenager, going to my Catholic priest and confessing my sins. And I said, you know, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. My last confession was three months ago or whatever. Here are my sins. And you begin to state your sins. And I only knew five. I said the same five every time. And one of them was lying. And finally he asked me, well, how many times have you lied? And I thought, do you think I keep track? So I lied and told him a number, you know. <laughs> you, you see, God demands 100% obedience to 100% of the laws, 100% of the time. And the fact is, we're all very guilty. In fact, if you're here today thinking you're good enough to go to heaven, the reality of the fact is you're not. And if we were to project on the screen your thoughts and your words and your actions over the last week, you'd be absolutely amazed. So what does the righteous and holy God of the universe say is the penalty or punishment of sin? Well, we saw it already. The day you eat, you shall die. Dying, you will die. Dying spiritually, you will die physically. And that's why the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Do you sense the guilt and shame of your sin? Before a holy God who rightly demands 100% obedience 100% of the time. Do you recognize that if God gave you what you deserve for your sin. He would have to condemn you to hell. For you are not good enough to go to heaven. For heaven is a perfect place for perfect people. And you and I do not fall. The third lesson we learn here from Genesis chapter 3. Regarding the divine pattern of provision of salvation. Is that God wants you to understand that, religion, that salvation cannot be obtained through your own efforts and religious works. That salvation cannot be obtained through your own efforts and religious works. Do you remember Operation Fig Leaves? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Did it do the job? No, as soon as they heard the voice of God, they still hid. And man still tries to cover his guilt and shame by denial or some form of escapism or by doing penance or by religious rituals or by trying to get their good works to outweigh their sins and all of this is futile. For Jeremiah 13, 23 tells us, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard its spots? And the answer is no. <coughs> The Ethiopian cannot change his skin no matter how much he may try. Nor can the leopard change its spots. Do you know why? Because spots are inherent to leopards. Just like sin is inherent to mankind. And no amount of human effort or religious works that we do can atone for or expiate or forgive our sins. Operation Fig Leaf just doesn't cut it. But like Adam and Eve, we foolishly try and try and try again until we finally come to grips with the stark reality that we are hopeless, helpless, and hell-bound sinners with no way or means to save ourselves from the punishment and penalty of sin we deserve apart from God's grace. Do you see yourself like that from God's point of view? You see, that is why Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You see, unclean thing is like a leper. 
In the Old Testament, if you had leprosy and someone came close, you were to say, unclean, unclean. So that they would stay at their distance. And you see, by virtue of our sin, our sin has separated us from God. We're unclean. Well, he said, what about the good things we do? Well, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. Filthy rags on a leper. And then our iniquities like the wind have also taken us away. Can you imagine going to the gates of heaven? And Jesus Christ says, why should I let you into my holy heaven? And you say, well, because I've tried to be good. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Filthy rag. Well, I've been baptized. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Filthy rag. Well, I've been confirmed. <clears throat> Wrong answer. Well, I've said the sinner's prayer and asked Jesus in my heart 60 times. <clears throat> Wrong answer. I tried to help my fellow man. I follow the five pillars of Islam. Fill in the blanks. It doesn't matter. Anything you claim to do for salvation is a filthy rag. So where does God want to get you into in your thinking? Titus chapter 3 says, For we were once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But he saved us. Not because of our goodness, but because of his mercy. God's mercy, that's what I need. God's grace, that's what we need. God's undeserved favor or kindness given to us because of who God is and what Christ has done, not because of who we are or what we have done. That's how God can save me, by his mercy. But I also know that I can't save myself. I'm like a drowning man going down river, headed for the falls. Who can save me? And that's the fourth element we see here in Genesis chapter. How God wants you to understand that his gracious provision and promise of salvation is found only in Jesus Christ. You see, verse 15 is about Jesus Christ. Here's the promise. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, Eve, and between your seed, the unseed, especially the Antichrist, and her seed, believers, and especially Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ, shall bruise or crush your or Satan's head, and you, Satan, shall bruise his, namely Jesus. You see, getting crushed in your head is fatal. Getting bruised on your heel is painful, but not fatal. And you see, this is the first promise of the gospel. That God would send a savior, a redeemer, who would crush the head of Satan. Though his heel would be bruised, which it was on what we would call religiously Good Friday, when he died for our sins. But it wasn't fatal, for on the third day he rose from the dead. And he is alive to provide salvation for us. And you see, that's exactly what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us how Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, that he was buried. That is the proof that he died. And he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. You see, the gospel is about a person, Jesus Christ. About a work, he died and he rose again. And about an accomplishment that when he died, he paid for our sins. And that is why 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And that includes you and me and Adam and Eve and everyone else. The next verse goes on to say, For there is one God... And one mediator between God and men. And who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. One mediator, not two. And it's Jesus Christ. And what did he do? Who gave himself a ransom for all. A ransom for all. To be testified in due time. You see, Jesus Christ gave himself in death. In payment for our sin, 
a ransom for everyone, because God wants everyone to be saved, and thus he is the only savior God ever provided, and therefore as the unique God-man, equal with both parties, he could be our mediator, and in doing so, he alone was qualified to say in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that is why the apostles preach, as Peter did, to the Sanhedrin in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And what is that name? The name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? There are not many ways to God. There is only one, according to the Bible. And it is through Jesus Christ. Do you realize that the whole plan of salvation is wrapped up in the person and finished work of Christ? Not in a ritual, as no ritual can save you. Not in a church, as no church can save you, including this one. But in the only Savior God ever provided, Jesus Christ. And do you know what saviors do? They what? They save. So how can you be saved from a hell you deserve to a heaven you don't? And that's the fifth truth we see in this passage. How God wants you to be willing to place your trust in Jesus Christ alone and his promises of salvation to you. God wants you to be willing to place your trust in Jesus Christ alone and his promises of salvation to you. Now remember, what is the promise? That the seed of the woman would crush the head of serpent. Did Adam and Eve believe the promise of God or not? Verse 20 is our answer. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. You see, Adam called his wife's name Eve. Now prior to that, her title was woman, Isha. But now he calls her by the name Eve. The name Eve speaks of life. She is the mother of all living. How many kids does she have right now? None. But God promised the seed of the woman. God promised the Redeemer. God promised that through the line of Eve, as it were, so a Savior would be provided. And you know what? Adam believed the promise. And so did Eve. And Adam took God at his word, and that's what faith does. Even though Adam couldn't see the Savior, he believed in him because God made a promise, and God always keeps his promises. Always. But as Adam believed God's promise and provision of salvation, what also did, did, did this involve by way of a change of mind about their fig tree, fig leaves? But what it involved, dear friends, is that they had to change their mind. They had to realize that those fig leaves couldn't come. In fact, they did a bad job at that. And they hid from God. And instead, they needed to change their mind. And you see, that's what repentance means. To change your mind. And Hebrews 6.1 talks about repentance from dead works. Changing your mind about those things that could never save. So that you trust in Christ alone. You know why? Because Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You see, dear friends, the issue really isn't repenting from your sins. Though you need to realize God is holy and you are a sinner and the penalty is death. But if you had to repent from your sins, what would that mean? How many sins? How often? How, how do you know when you're ever there? It's not an issue of changing your mind about your sins. It's a matter of changing your mind about Jesus Christ, who died for your sins and who rose again. That's what the gospel is all about. It reminds me of the story of a pastor who was visiting a teenager who was deathly ill and was soon to die. And this pastor had given this boy the gospel. Well, this boy had previously heard about Jesus Christ and thought you needed to believe in him, but also thought you had to do this, 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 and this in order to be saved. And so the gospel was presented, and when the pastor came back to visit him again, the boy was just, his face was shining with joy. 
and with the assurance he was saying. And he said, what was the difference? And he said, here's the difference. Before, I thought Christ's death was necessary. Now I understand it is enough. It is enough. It's not faith in Christ plus, but faith in Christ, period. And that's why the Bible says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now I find it interesting, if you think about this scenario we're reading, question, were Adam and Eve spiritually dead? Answer, yes, separated from God, a right relationship with God. Were they totally depraved now? Yes, from head to toe. But could they still believe? And were they still responsible or held responsible to believe? And were they able to make a choice that then resulted in their salvation? And the answer was absolutely. You see, faith is not a gift. Salvation is the gift. If faith was a gift, how could you ever refuse it if it's forced upon you and therefore is not a gift? For a gift is either freely chosen or rejected. You see, salvation is the gift, and therefore God holds everyone responsible whether they will put their faith in Jesus Christ or not. And that is why Galatians 2.21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, something you do for God, then Christ is dead in vain. You see, if your faith is in Christ plus, then you've just said Christ didn't do enough. And therefore, if you could go to heaven by your good works, tell me why did Jesus have to come and die? And that's why the Philippian jailer brought up Paul and Silas and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You say, that sounds too simple, but it is. Because Christ did it all. And this brings us to the sixth aspect in the divine pattern and provision of salvation, namely, that God wants you to understand and believe that his provision for your sins is made possible through the substitutionary death of an innocent blood sacrifice to clothe you. That God wants you to understand and believe that his provision for your sins is made possible through the substitutionary death of an innocent blood sacrifice. Look at verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made what? Tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, when Moses' readers, as Moses was the human author, years later, writing to the children of Israel, if they, as they read this, they would immediately think, sacrifice, <coughs> covering, atonement, substitute, they, they had gone through, again, the great exodus, and prior to that, the Passover lamb, shedding that lamb's blood, that innocent lamb, and having that blood applied to the doorpost or the lintel, so that when the angel of death came, he would pass over. They would be familiar with all that sacrificial system, as they were repeatedly, in essence, taught, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. So who initiated this promise and provision of salvation? The Lord God did. And he does with us as well. Now why did he do this? Because he loved them and he wanted to have an eternal relationship with them. Now did Adam and Eve deserve this? And the answer is no. What did they deserve? Death. The judgment of God and ultimately hell. But God wanted to provide salvation for them. So who made the tunics of skin? The Lord God made tunics of skin. It was the Lord God who did this. And Adam and Eve contributed nothing to this covering. So what did it require to provide these tunics? Well, in order to provide tunics of skin, and by the way, the word skin there is referring to animal skin. It would require the death of an innocent animal. And Adam and Eve most likely were right there to observe the first physical death on the planet. God sacrificing innocent animal to die in the place of the guilty. 
For the penalty for sin was death and the penalty had to be paid. But instead, this animal died in the sinner's place. And as a result, God provided through that death a covering for their sin. To what extent did God make this provision for sin? The Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. For every person in the human race at that time, which was only two. But what a picture of the fact that when Christ died on the cross, he paid for all sin, for all time, for all people, because God wants all people to be saved. Now what animal is likely sacrificed? A lamb. Now I can't say that dogmatically, but we have a really good reason to think that. You say, why? Because in the very next chapter, in the story of Cain and Abel, we see what sacrifices they brought. And what did Abel bring? A lamb. Where did he learn that from? Mommy and daddy. That's where he learned it. That you approach God with the sacrifice of an innocent animal. And in fact, most likely here, a lamb. And what or who did this sacrifice picture? The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And why did God do this? Because God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And on that cross, he died for you. On that cross, he died for me. On that cross, he died for Adam and Eve. This was all a picture of what Christ would ultimately do. And on that cross, he cried out, To tell us, die, which means it is finished. My sin has been paid in full. Do you believe this? For you see, God believes it. For on the third day, God's holy demands against our sin were so satisfied through Christ's death on the cross, that on the third day, he raised Christ from the dead in order to provide a living Savior who could give us eternal life. If we were willing to accept, as it were, the great exchange, for he, God, made him, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And why does it say might? Because the provision is made, the gift is offered, but you must believe it for yourself. He took our sin in order to give us his righteousness. God's tunics or coats of skin replaced their covering of fig leaves. God clothed them. They didn't clothe themselves. Why would God do that for you and me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why does it say might again? Because the provision has been made, but the gift must be accepted. What are your two options? Option number one, who believes in him is not condemned. He's saved. He has eternal life. He who does not believe is condemned already. Why? Because he has not believed, never believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's not the sin issue, it is the Son issue. So in a sense, the lost sinner condemns himself or herself to hell because they're not willing to accept the one provision for sin that God made when Jesus Christ died for them and rose again to save them. And God is such a perfect gentleman, though he's a pursuing lover of your soul, that he will not force you to believe. He'll let you make that choice. But I can tell you this. If someone dies and goes to hell, it's not because they had to go. Though they deserved to go. Because a provision of salvation was made. A gift was offered. But a gift that they rejected through unbelief. So what have we learned about God's pattern and provision today? We need to grasp who God is. He is creator. He is sovereign. He is holy. And we ultimately give an account to him. We need to grasp who we are. 
We were created in the image of God in order to have a relationship with God, but we've all sinned to come short of the glory of God. We need to come to grips with what we des deserve, the penalty of sin, which is death. We need to come to grips with what God has promised and provided, a Savior in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a full payment for our sins when He died for us and rose again to save us. We must come to grips with how God offers salvation to us, solely by His grace, as undeserving as we are, apart from our works, rituals, or efforts to keep the law. And we must come to grips with how one receives God's gift of salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Thus lastly, number seven, God wants you to understand and believe that His provision and promises to you when personally believed guarantees you a permanent cloak clothing of salvation. And that physical death will ultimately be a blessing to you that need not be feared. God wants you to understand and believe that His provision and promises to you when personally believed guarantees you a permanent clothing of salvation. And that physical death will ultimately be a blessing to you that need not be feared. You see, for the believer, absent from the body is present with the Lord. For the believer, we know to die is, and to depart is far better. For the believer, we know when we die, we're going to heaven, though we know we deserve that. And it's all because of Jesus Christ and the promises of God. So we see now in Genesis 3, verse 22, these words. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. Now please note the word us. We saw this in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. You see, God is a trinity. There's only one God, but in that unity of God, there are three persons again. The man has become like one of us to know good and evil. The difference, though, is that man now knew evil experientially, where God knew evil objectively or inherently without experiencing the evil. And with that choice to know good and evil came devastating consequences. But God says now, and now, lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life, remember, which was in the middle of the garden, just like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And should he take of the tree of life and eat and live forever? What does that mean? That means if they were given opportunity to eat of that tree, eat of that tree, they would live eternally as a sinner. They would live immortally in that sinful state they are now in. And that is why, in one sense, it is a blessing to die, for finally you shed this sin-decaying body, and you shed that sinful soul, as it were, that's been redeemed, but still we have a sin nature. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken, though the tilling would be a whole lot tougher than before. So he drove out the man. Isn't that interesting? He drove him out. You know why? They didn't want to leave, would you? And he placed cherubim, these angelic creatures, and again, that's plural, at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree. These actions show that God was sympathetic to their situation. He was gracious to them. Why? Because He was going to allow them to die physically and not live eternally as a sinner. For upon dying, your soul and spirit are separated from your body. If you are saved, you go to be with the Lord. If you are lost, you go to hell. But your body, either way, goes into the ground, awaiting the day in which it will be resurrected and reunited with your soul, either in life or in death. 
Now, how many times did God clothe Adam and Eve? It was permanent. How many times does God save a lost sinner? It's one time. When you're saved, you're saved forever. And when they were driven out of the garden, did they forfeit the skin covering of God? At the door, did they have to take it off and leave it? No. It's a permanent covering, not based upon their behavior, but because of God's grace. Now, they had many decisions they would still make once they leave the garden. But one thing was clear. They're covered. <laughs> They're clothed. They have an eternal relationship with God. They have eternal life. Though they would experience physical death. And once you are saved by the grace of God, you still have many decisions to make. And there are consequences to those decisions. Either good or bad. But one thing is clear. Once you've been clothed, you're clothed. Once you've been saved, you're saved. Once you have eternal life, It can never be forfeited. And that is why John 5, 24 says, Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. That is why Jesus Christ said regarding believers, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Thus you can say with the Apostle Paul, if you are a believer in Christ today, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our <coughs> Wow. Let's close in 1 John chapter 5. God wants you to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you've been saved. And he wants you to know that when you're saved, you're saved forever. And so we read in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 9 how you can have this assurance. If we receive the witness of men, and we do, we believe what people say. The witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of the Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. How do you make God out to be a liar? Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony. That God has given us eternal life. And this life is found where? In his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you. Who's you? You who believe in the name of the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, God says you can know before you die that you have, you possess eternal life. The condition is to believe. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for your sins and rose again. And you can be guaranteed that because God says these things I've written to you. And God always keeps it. And thus, based upon the work of Christ and the word of God, you can know for sure you're saved and saved forever if your faith is in Christ alone. But the objective isn't merely just to know you're saved, but that you may continue to believe in the name of you're born again at a point in time, but God then wants to teach you how to walk by faith. He wants to teach you to keep believing in the name of the Son of God. Though continuing to believe in the Son of God isn't necessary to know you have eternal life. That's done at the moment of faith in Christ alone. Just like they knew they were clothed, from that moment God clothed them. They didn't have to wake up every morning and say, Hey Eve, am I clothed? Adam, am I clothed? Well, of course you are. Now, a pastor friend of mine, Sean Lachlan, said, you know, if those are sheep, that means they had wool underwear. This is what he said. 
Well, that doesn't sound very fun. Well, the fact of the matter is... I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Here, when I'm just getting right to the gospel appeal, right? The truth is, you need to be clothed. And you see, Jesus Christ came so that in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. He conquered Satan. He conquered sin. He conquered death. He that has the Son now has life. And to approach God, you must have a proper covering for your sin. It's either your fig leaf approach or the covering God provided, a covering or robe of righteousness through faith in Christ alone. Which one is it? Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this incredible picture, this pattern, this illustration, this example of all the key components of salvation found there in Genesis chapter 3. You made it clear to the first couple. And you made it even clearer as time would go on in defining exactly who that Savior would be, Jesus Christ. Defining exactly what he would do to provide salvation. He would die for our sins and be raised again. Defining very clearly how we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So that we can know we have eternal life. And once again, Father, should someone be here today who doesn't know. Who instead thought it was faith in Christ plus. May right now in the quietness of their heart where they're seated, they recognize they don't have to raise a hand. They don't have to sign a card. They don't have to pray a prayer. They don't have to walk an aisle. But like Adam and Eve, they must accept by faith, out of their own volition, the provision of salvation that you made. When Christ died for their sins and rose again so as to trust in him alone to give them to heaven, to give them eternal life. Their sins. And for those of us who have been saved, may even this patch of scripture and even this day just remind us again of the finished work of our Savior, the salvation we have, the eternal life we possess, the assurance of knowing we're going to heaven, and the great purpose now to live for him who died for us. We thank you so much in Jesus' name.